finishing up in the series on the book of Malachi. Uh, next week we'll be finishing up actually. Uh, so let me go straight into the passage today. So, uh, the question I want to start off with today is, what are you afraid of? What are some of the things that you are afraid of? Go ahead and shout them out. What, what are you afraid of? Getting married. Getting married? Wow. Not getting married. Bless you, guys. Okay. Um, he's single, by the way, ladies. <laughs> but anyway. Okay. But what, what else are you afraid of? Clowns, okay, so don't watch the movie It, okay. That's what made me afraid. Ah, the original It, right? Okay. <laughs> Anything else? Tornado. Anything else you're afraid of? Huh? Tornadoes. Tornadoes, okay. I drove through a tornado once. Ooh. And so there's a kid here who, like, who, who, like, worships me because I'm the tornado pastor. <laughs> Regardless. Anything else? Very hmm? Very Getting old. Okay, old age, right? Um, it's inevitable, but yes, it is something that we can fear. What else? What are also other things that we fear? Judgment. Okay, it's a millennial talking right there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anything else? Criticism. Criticism, same <laughs> Okay. Um, so with that, there are a lot of things that we're afraid of, uh, but... This passage is actually going to be talking about more about fearing God, so we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but with that, let's go ahead and go to Malachi 3. We're going to go verses 13 to 18. Malachi 3, 13 to 18. Open your Bibles, smartphones, or look at the screen. The word of the Lord says this. You have spoken arrogantly against me, says the Lord. Yet you ask, what have we said against you? You have said it is futile to serve God. What do we gain by carrying out His requirements and going about like mourners before the Lord Almighty? But now we call the arrogant blessed. Certainly evildoers prosper, and even when they put God to the test, they get away with it. Then those who feared the Lord talked with each other, and the Lord listened and heard. A scroll of remembrance was written in His presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored His name. On the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty, they will be my treasured possession. I will spare them, just as a father has compassion and spares his son who serves him. And you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. Uh, we're in the theme of 2019 of holiness and understanding that as God is holy, we are called like Him to be holy, to be set apart. So our, our hope for this year is to get a better understanding of what that means. And so we've been going through the book of Malachi for that reason. Um, and we saw first off that God proved, He showed uh, the Israelites clearly that He loved them. And He desired for them to show love back, so He desired for them to worship Him, but they continually sent Him inferior or worthless worship. And worse still, it was the priests, the Levites who, himself, uh, who, who, who themselves were leading this type of inferior worship. And so God continues and starts, starts, starts telling about these things that he, he despises, that the people were part of, people that were divorcing their wives because they were trying to marry foreigners for their benefit. And so God tells them, I hate divorce. I hate unfaithfulness. I'm a God of justice, and I will prove it by sending not one, but two messengers. One who will call out and prepare the way, and one who will bring about this covenant, and bring about this, this righteousness that I desire. And so then we saw that, that God desires us to, to just trust that he, he is a God of justice, and in that place to understand that our tithing, our giving to God reveals our hearts. When we do not give generously to God, that shows where our hearts truly are. And I know that was a rather difficult message last week, from what I've heard from some feedback. And just to just talk very briefly on that, it's in the Bible, very clearly, that this is what God desires of His people. And so it's also in the Bible that God gives. So what, whatever we receive is given unto us. So giving back to God what He has already given to you is honestly not that difficult. But we're living in an age where we have other priorities. We have other things that we focus our attention on. And rather than giving God what He desires of us, we don't. 
But as he said last week, test me in this. Test me. If you give me the full tithe, test me and I will show you how much more I will shower you with goodness and mercy. So much so that you will be overflowing. And with that in mind, we continue into this passage today where he brings about the final charge. So we're going to kind of unpack this this week as well as next week. Um, but this is the final charge where he says, you have been saying harsh words about me. You have been speaking arrogantly about me. He's like, what are you talking about? This is what you're saying. It is futile to serve God. Basically, they're saying, serving God is of no value, of no worth to us. And the reason why is because what do we gain? What good is it? What is the purpose of serving God when everybody else who doesn't, everyone else who is arrogant is blessed, everyone else who does evil prospers, and even those that, that cry out against God, they get away with it, right? This is what the Israelites were, were saying to God. They were speaking out against Him and saying these things, and basically were asking, what's in it for us? Now, brothers and sisters, um, I think I got hit with this early on when I was doing ministry. Um, I was, I had just graduated from college. You know, I was actually younger than a lot of you guys here. I was the age of 21 when I graduated from college. Um, I got thrown into suddenly leading the young adult ministry, and I'm like, I just graduated college. What's going on? Um, and so I was, I was trying to start up this young little ministry, and I remember I gathered the young adults that I knew of that were attending this church. And um, I just asked him, like, what should we do? How should we meet? And I remember being very discouraged because the thing I kept hearing again and again is, what benefit is this to us? Right? What is the point of us gathering? What do we gain from this? Like, I don't want to come if it's a waste of time. That was kind of the attitude that was thrown back at me. And I think for myself specifically, I started to understand what, where this mentality was coming from. Because for me specifically, once I graduated from college and I was working, I was making money, I was taking care of my own bills, I was quote unquote responsible for the first time in my life. All of a sudden, I know this isn't true anymore, and I'm realizing this, but back then, back then when I was a college student, the one thing I needed, or the one thing I lacked was money. I think one of the things at least I learned in my generation, you learn about poverty when you're in college. Right? I got to the point where I could not use the ATM because my, my balance had gone below the minimum withdrawal. Right? It was $10 back then. I had $9.27 in my bank. And I was like, oh my goodness, I am poor. Right? And so I, 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 you know, I worked jobs. Um, I, I did a lot of you know, Araba, I guess is what they call it here in Korea. You know, that's a German word, so it cracks me up. Like, Koreans are using a German word to talk about part-time jobs. Um, but regardless, I was like, I threw something like that. Anyway, <laughs> but regardless, um, I, I did a lot of part-time jobs. I worked, and once I, I, I became a working adult, and I was an engineer, and I was making money, all of a sudden, my need for finances disappeared. And I was like, this is awesome. I have money. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, I was like, I have no time. <laughs> because when you're working, you know, you're working Monday to Friday, right? And so the thing that I realized as a single working adult, the thing that was most precious to not only me, but to all other single working adults, was their weekends. Right? Don't you dare take my weekend away. Right? <laughs> And so then I started to realize, this is why people don't like going to church. Because all of a sudden, that time is becoming, is being taken away. And so I started to realize that there was a shift. Once I became a working adult, time was my pre most precious commodity. Now I'm realizing this is a little bit different today because even university students today are like unnecessarily busy. And I'm realizing even for university students, time is almost of equal value as it is to working adults, almost. And they're also poor. So it's like a horrible situation. <laughs> <laughs> you 
you know, you're poor, you have no time. But anyway, um, so, so this is what I started to realize where this mentality comes from is when something becomes so precious to you that you don't necessarily want to give it to God anymore. And I think this is what was going on with the Israelites, whereas they were valuing other things. They were valuing like wealth and, and property, family, and all these different things became a higher priority than God. And they started to ask, what is the point of what we're doing? What am I getting out of this? And so they look and they see these other people that are thriving, they're doing well, and they're doing it by disobeying God. Right? And honestly, I think this is, a, I've talked about this before, I think this is an issue here in Korea, where when you see people succeeding by cutting corners and by kind of being slightly immoral, there's a temptation to follow suit. There's a temptation to do the same thing. Because if you don't, then you're actually at a disadvantage. And so here the Israelites, they see, and now this is not people from other countries. This is their own countrymen. These are other Israelites that are being disobedient and wicked before God, and yet they are thriving. When we, when we look at the books of Nehemiah and Ezra, we see that Jews were actually taking advantage of each other. Many of them were getting wealthy and were prospering because of the people that were coming back from exile, and they were being oppressed, basically, being used as cheap labor. So it's basically countrymen making money off of the misfortune of other countrymen. This is what they saw. And so as they see this, they say, what is the point of serving God? When people that are doing what is wrong before Him are actually prospering. And as, as I've said before, brothers and sisters, this is a question that every one of us faces, regardless of whatever our context is. If you're a student, there's going to be a pressure. You see other people that are bending the rules of academics, right? And so there's like, there's the thought, I need to do the same thing, right? We call that what? Cunning, right? In Korea, cunning. So you see like a, a, a desire to, to cut corners. And everyone that does it is prospering. Back when I was in, in high school, the, the thing there that was big there was uh, what we call cliff notes. I don't even know if they exist anymore, honestly, because I don't think people read anymore. But regardless, um, back when I was in high school, when we had assignments, we had to read a book, you could buy a summary of the book, right? So you could just read that summary and know the entirety of what you need for that book to do well in school without actually reading the book. I know those things still exist today, right? Spark notes, right? <laughs> and so... So, to me, that was cutting corners. Those things always exist. Now, the thing is, smart teachers, smart professors, they know these things exist, and so they make it so that you don't do well if you don't read the actual material. Right? I had one English teacher, he hated Cliff Notes so much that he completely threw out the entire curriculum for the 11th grade and made us read books that were off, like. The no clip notes existed. I actually enjoyed it because I read authors I would have never read. Kurt Vonnegut became my favorite author. And then I, I went, and then when I got into university, I found out Kurt Vonnegut was a graduate from my university. I was so proud. <laughs> Some of you guys are like, what are you talking about? Like, was that, that that weird slaughterhouse five guy? Was that? Um, but regardless, um, what I'm trying to say is. It's very easy to see people doing well by disobeying God. And it's very easy for us to question, why should I be the one that's suffering? Why should I be the one that's at a disadvantage when everyone else? And I'm not talking about foreign, like people far, far away. I'm talking about people that are in your church, people that are in your community. It's really hard not to follow suit. And that's, that's the, the challenge that God is giving to the Israelites here. And so these people ask, what's the point? Now I'm going to take a very quick aside very quickly here. Um, because one of the things I realized as I was preparing for this message is, um, you know, the, the question is, is serving God valuable? Is serving God something of worth? 
And I say yes. But at the same time, I know some of us have experienced different churches and ministries that demand too much. Right? And, I, and for me personally, as a pastor, and someone who worked as an engineer for seven years be before I became a pastor, I kind of have a different perspective. <coughs> because I think most people that go into ministry, they kind of forget that, that, you know, church people usually don't have a day off. Right? Most people that aren't pastors work Monday to Friday, in Korea probably Monday to Saturday, some of you Monday to Sunday, regardless, you guys all have these work hours, and then you have this little weekend that's left. And what a lot of churches like to do is they take 100% of that weekend. You're not tithing, you're giving 100% of your weekend to the church. And it's supposed to be, oh, that, that's what you're supposed to do. And then it's not just your weekend. Then you have your, your, your midweek services. You have your, your prayer meetings. And then all of a sudden, the amount of time that you're giving to church can almost equal the amount of time you're working. Right? And I'm just going to say it for myself, as someone who kind of understands both perspectives, I do feel that pastors and churches have a responsibility to make sure that their church people do not overwork themselves. There is a reason why God taught us about the Sabbath. Because God knows that if we don't intentionally rest, we will work ourselves to death. And what I want, what I want to say for those of you that have experienced hurt from getting pressure to give too much of your time and your effort sometimes to the church then I apologize on behalf of the church I do feel that pastors and the church need to take more responsibility because the funny thing is that the first thing they teach us in seminary is protect your Sabbath and for us that's Monday right so you'll hear cases of like pastors that don't answer their phone on Mondays right and I understand that and I respect that but at the same time what about people that aren't pastors? Okay. Your Sabbath is Saturday. Oh, we have a leaders meeting Saturday. Oh, we have a church event Saturday. Oh, we have weddings on Saturday. So it's like all those days often are not free. And so I, I want to take a moment to, to tell those of you that have been hurt and who have and given much more than you felt was necessary. I apologize. But at the same time, I still truly believe that serving God is worthwhile. Serving God is the most worthwhile thing. But at the same time, God has called you for specific seasons. If you are a student, God has called you to be a student first. So I always tell people, don't overextend yourselves. Make sure you focus on your first priority. If you're supposed to be a student, do it to the best of your ability. But still spend time with God. Still be part of community. Serve the church. But... Focus on your studies first, right? So on and so forth. If you're working, you know, if you're raising a family, you have priorities that should be met first. But at the same time, there's a balance between serving God and whatever you're supposed to be focusing on right now. I can't give you an exact answer. Serve this X amount of hours and you're good. No, I can't tell you that. But I can tell you that there needs to be more wisdom and there needs to be more protection. And that's what I think is lacking in the church today. On that note, if you're looking for places to serve, I have plenty of things I can give you. <laughs> With that said, this is the reality. So the people of God were saying, what is the point of serving? What, is the, what, what do we get out of it when everyone else is benefiting from not serving and from not being obedient to God? The reality as we looked at in the entirety of the, of the book of Malachi is this is the heart of the people that were questioning God. They were giving worthless worship to Him. They were giving Him inadequate worship. What I mean by that was they were giving sacrifices of animals that they shouldn't have. They were sending the lame. They were sending the injured. They were sending animals that they shouldn't have. They weren't giving God their best. Furthermore, we, we saw earlier in chapter 3, God accuses them. He says, I will put you on trial. 
And these are the things I will accuse you of. Sorcery. People putting their faith in magic. Adultery. Being unfaithful in, their, in the marriages. Perjury. Being liars. Defrauding laborers. Basically taking advantage of people that work for you. Giving them lower wages than you should. Oppressing widows and orphans. Taking advantage of those that are in, 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 in very vulnerable positions. And injustice to foreigners. Right? I talked about this a couple weeks ago. There's a lot of injustice to foreigners in Korea. <laughs> um, like I said before, if you can't speak Korean, you're at a very, very big disadvantage in this nation. And last week when we talked about the fact that they weren't giving tithes and offering, it was showing not only their lack of generosity to God, but the fact that the tithe was used to help those in need showed that they were not giving, they, they were not being generous to others as well. So brothers and sisters, what I'm trying to tell you here is the people that were telling God you are not giving us anything of value, this is how they were acting. This is how their heart. But at the same time, brothers and sisters, we have to often ask ourselves that same question. Where is my heart? Am I truly trying to give God my best? Or am I going through the motions? Are other things of greater value and worth Am I truly seeking to worship Him? And so the question that they were asking is, what has God done for me? What has God done for me? I think a lot of us will sometimes have this mentality that we expect certain things from God, right? My brother talked about how you know he's afraid of not getting married, so he expects that God will give him a wife, right? <laughs> Brother, I had to wait 20 years. <laughs> I'm not calling that upon you, JP. But at the same time, we don't know what God is going to give us. And it's not in our place to demand what we want from God. But God gives generously. God gives graciously. God gives in abundance. So brothers and sisters, if you have a, a just a, a heart that receives rather than demands, you're in a much better place. You're in a much better place. And so the passage shifts, and then it starts talking about those who feared the Lord, those who feared Him started to talk with each other. So you're seeing that God is speaking to Israel, but now there's a small portion of Israel that fears Him still and says, we, there's something's not right. We need to do something about this. So brothers and sisters, this is what we call the faithful remnant. When you look throughout the Old Testament, especially in the times of exiles, it doesn't talk about a mass nation of Israel anymore. It talks about a remnant. And I truly believe, brothers and sisters, we are in the time of being the remnant of God. That the church is in a position where it is being tested and challenged and only a small portion is actually going to continue to obey and to listen to Him. That is what I mean by the remnant of God, those who fear Him. So when we see the word fear, we, we often, you know, it's a very negative thing, but if you actually look at the Hebrew, there's, there's different words that, that talk about fear. Pahad and aratz, those words usually talk about dread and being terrified, but yare, uh, which is the word that's being used here, yare talks about not just fear, but also respect, reverence. We should fear God, but we shouldn't necessarily be afraid or terrified of Him. If there was someone that, you know, let's say like, so our head pastor is, is actually on vacation right now, but let's say for some reason he just walked in right now, right? A lot of you don't know him, so a lot of you probably be like, oh, I don't know who this guy is, but some of you do. So for those of you that know him, you would show him respect, right? You would bow, you would, you know, you would, you would greet him. You would be like, hey, what's up, Jongbu? Right? And that's the name, by the way. Like, that would be very disrespectful. But it's because you honor him and you respect him, you are fearing him. Right? You are giving him the reverence and respect that, that you should. And ultimately, that's what 
That, that's what is going on. These people that are fearing God are revering Him. They are respecting Him. They are honoring Him. Now what the Word says about this book, uh, about this verb, Yahweh, is it shows up oftentimes in the Bible. Proverbs 3, we see, Fear the Lord and shun evil. Uh, Deuteronomy 31, uh, Assemble the people so that they can listen and learn to fear the Lord your God and follow carefully all the words of this law. Proverbs 9, 10, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. When you respect and revere God, what the Word says is, first off, it turns you away from evil. Right? If you truly respect God, you start to not want to be anything, not have any part of, of evil. Second passage talks about how fearing God actually allows us to focus more on obeying, obeying the Word of God. And lastly, the very famous uh, phrase, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That is how we start living lives of wisdom. It's by first fearing God, respecting Him. So brothers and sisters, this is what we're called to be, those who respect God. And through that fear and reverence, it, it, it shuns us away from evil. It brings us back into the Word. And it allows us to seek a life of wisdom. If you guys remember about a month or two ago uh, when I was talking about the Levites, and I, I asked the question, for those of you that ever asked me about finding the, a good church, like say you move on, I said there are two things to look for. A ministry that, that encourages you to turn away from evil, to turn away from sin, and to turn back to God. Same thing. Fearing God does this. Fearing God allows us to grow in our relationship with Him. We have to respect Him. And I think, honestly, this is one of the things that's become difficult in this particular era, is that, here's the thing, when I look at my parents, they might have feared God a little too much. Right? Where all of a sudden, like, it became more about doing things for God and earning His love and respect. And like they, the, they feared him so much that their relationship was kind of far. But then I think with the current generation, it's like we're too close to God. We're too casual. We're too comfortable. So much so that we don't give him the respect and fear that we do. We should. So we're kind of stuck. So brothers and sisters, what I want us to understand is that we should have a reverent fear for God. We should Know who He is and give Him the honor that He deserves. And by doing so, that turns us away from sin, that turns us back to the Word, and that leads us down the path of wisdom. And the passage continues, it says, Those who feared Him were talking amongst themselves, and God heard. God heard. He listened to what they were saying, and He heard that God was moved by those that feared Him. God had been complaining against Israel, but now that those who fear Him are speaking out, He hears them. So brothers and sisters, when we fear God, and we turn to Him, and we start, and this is in the place of community, because it says, they, right? As they spoke with each other. In the place of community, in the church, as we share, and as we are, are transformed by what we hear, God is moved by that. And so I've been actually very thankful for our small group ministry this past semester. They're actually done now, but, um, but I, I do think that as a body, as we come together, and as we share about the things God is challenging us, and as we grow in that way, not only do we transform, but God listens and hears us. And so the passage continues and says, A scroll of remembrance was written in His presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored His name. Basically, when God sees the works of His people, when He sees those who fear Him, He starts writing down what they're doing. Now, bear in mind, God has infinite memory and wisdom, right? So God doesn't need to write anything down, but God writes it down for us. That we would be honored, that we would be remembered. 
you guys know the book of Esther, there's, there's a, the story about how Mordecai does something nice for the king, and he writes it down, and he forgets about it. And then years later, he said, oh, didn't so-and-so so -and -so do something? Who was that? And so he reads the book, he's reminded, and then he goes and honors Mordecai. In a similar sense, God is saying, I will not forget. I will never forget what you have done in my name. I will never forget your faithfulness to me. It is written down. It is permanent. It will always be there. So brothers and sisters, when we serve God, when we are faithful to Him, this is something God will always remember. This is something that God will always honor us for. And then He starts saying, on the day when I act, they will be my treasured possession. I will spare them just as the Father has compassion and spares His Son who serves Him. That faithful few, that remnant few, God says, they are most precious to me. You are my treasured possession. And not only that, I will show you mercy. Even though you deserve to be punished, even though you deserve to be disciplined, I will protect you from that. I will give you the grace and love and honor that you actually don't deserve, but I want to give to you. Those who are faithful will be treasured by Him and will be shown mercy. And then He ended by saying there will be a distinction. Now we're going to talk about this more next week. But when God says there will be a distinction, this should bring up immediately into the, the memories of those from Israel of the time in Egypt. When Moses, when Moses came and said, you know, take uh, the people of God want to go and worship Him. He is calling for them to leave Egypt to worship. And then you have these plagues, right? We went through the book of Exodus a couple years ago. You have these plagues. The first couple, I think the first three, everyone experienced, right? Uh, the, the water turning into blood and the, uh, what was it, the frogs and the, the gnats. These were all things that everyone experienced, including Israelites. But from that point on, from the flies on, God said there will be a distinction. So basically from that point on, every single judgment, every single plague that God put on Egypt only happened to the Egyptians. The Israelites, they didn't experience that at all. Right? When the livestock died, it only happened in the, in the where the Egyptians lived, not where the Israelites were. When there was like no no light when it was all darkness. I don't know how this worked, but in that one place where the Israelites were, it was bright. Right? God showed a distinction. He showed mercy on His people. And in the same way, what we're going to see next week, when God brings His judgment, the people of God, those who are faithful to Him, are going to be removed from that judgment. There will be a distinction. There will be a difference. That is what God promises to us. So brothers and sisters, our challenge for today is to be faithful. To, to remember what it means to fear God. And in that fear and in that respect, to turn from sin. To turn back to the Word of God and to seek His wisdom. To seek to live that life, that life of holiness that we've been trying to focus on this year. And instead of these other things... Instead of fearing all these other little things that we can fear. Whether we fear failure, whether we feel fear of rejection. Focus on God alone. Put your respect, put your emphasis, put your honor all on Him alone. And as we do that, He will lead us. Let's take some time to pray. Go ahead and close for today. I want to take a moment to, to ask God, God, are there things that I'm fearing more than you? Are there things that I am giving reverence and honor to instead of you? Am I focused more on my career? Am I focused too much on my studies? Am I focused on relationships? Am I focusing on my children? Whatever it might be, I want you to ask God, God, if there are areas in my life that are taking me away from my relationship with you, 
Help me to see that and help me to instead fix my eyes on you and you alone. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, and we praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.